Okay, so let's uh, start by finishing off the string lecture from yesterday. Um, so we saw that there, where did we? We were doing a compare to at the end of last lecture. So we had just finished that, I think. So uh, just to remind you, uh, compare to is the, um, compare to is like less than and greater than uh, and equal to for strings. Right. So if I have a string S and a string T, Right. Uh, where S is aardvark, or T S refers to aardvark, uh, T refers to zebra, uh, then S compared to T returns uh, some negative integer value uh, that indicates that S is uh, less than Z, or S comes before, sorry, uh, the string S comes before the string T, um, because aardvark comes before zebra in the dictionary. Uh, if you compare the same string, Right, or strings that are equal to one another, you get back zero, right? So zero indicates that uh, in this case, the strings are equal, right? They represent the same sequence of characters. Uh, and then finally, if you compare the strings in the opposite order, right? So here's S compared to T, this is T compared to S, right? Then the sign changes, right? So this was less than zero, it's now greater than zero because T, right, which is zebra, uh, comes after aardvark. Um, so, in other words, T is greater than S, right? Or for strings, T comes after S, or the string T comes after the string S. Now, compare to does not exist for all Java classes. Uh, so, the way you can tell whether or not a class has a compare to method uh, is when you look at the documentation. Right? So, here's the documentation for our class string, right? Uh, if you see under the all implemented interfaces section, comparable, right? The interface comparable, then you know that the class has a compare to method. We're going to see interfaces later on in the course, uh, but I might as well tell you about them now. Uh, so a class is able to implement what's called an interface. Um, if you click on the interface, so let's do that. So when you click on the interface, uh, it tells you if you read the uh, documentation for the uh, interface. It says that um, uh, the comparable interface imposes a total ordering on objects of the class that it represents, uh, that implements it. So this ordering is referred to as the class's natural ordering, uh, and the class's compare to method is referred to as its natural comparison method. So what it's trying to tell you is that compare to is the analog of less than and greater than, right? Uh, it only has one method, right? So it even tells you what the compare to method does. Right. So because the string implements this interface, you know for a uh, you know for certain that there is a compare to method. Uh, and if you scroll down to the documentation, the sorry, the method summary, you will in fact find the compare to method. All right. All right. Uh, here we go. The last method I want to tell you about uh, in the string class is the replace method. Uh, so re the replace method will replace all occurrences of a character. Uh, or a string with a specified character or string. So replace is one of those methods that can take in, uh, that will accept as input either a car right, or a string. Okay, so you can do, do either. So if you pass in a car, I believe you have, to, you have to pass in a second car. So this will replace every car P with the car T in the string referred to by S. So if you have the string sparring with a purple porpoise and you replace all the P's with T's, right, you end up with starring with a turtle tortoise. Uh, if you want to replace a substring in a string, right, you can do that. So if I want to replace all the substrings uh, that are equal to hi-ho with the string oh no, these don't have to be the same length. Uh, they just happen to be the same length here. Uh, but they can be different lengths, um, then what will end up happening is you will get back the string, uh, oh no, oh no, it's off to work we go. So the replace method does uh, exactly what you think it does. It replaces a character with another character, or it replaces a substring with another substring. Right? And there's lots and lots and lots of other methods in the string class. Um, the only way to, um, I mean, the way you should learn about how uh, what the methods do is to hit that link or a similar link uh, 
um, and uh, look at the documentation for the class. All right, so that's all I want to talk about for strings uh, for the time being. Uh, anybody have any questions about strings in Java? Before I move on to the next lecture. All right. Uh, so I'm not exactly sure what you were taught regarding floating point uh, uh, arithmetic or float, the way floating point numbers work in C uh, in in your previous C courses. Um, so I'm going to do something today. Hopefully it's not completely. Hopefully it's it's hopefully that you learn something new. I mean, it's not all review, right? So in C, you have the types float and double. Right? You also have those types in Java. Uh, they mean uh, in most C implementations on the desktop, right? So in other words, um, in most C implementations where you run on a computer that's got a monitor, float and double in C uh, are the same or behave the same as float and double in Java. Um, so the types float and double, they are approximations of real numbers. Right? So they aren't the same thing. They are approximations. They're approximations because float and double uh, have a fixed and finite amount of memory, right? So real numbers you can have, right? So real numbers, you can have an arbitrary length real number. Um, you have finite memory on a computer, so there's no way to represent, um, is, there's no way to exactly represent every possible real number, right? It's, it's uh, simply impossible. You need an infinite amount of memory. Um, this leads to some surprising things uh, when you do arithmetic with uh, float and double. So for example, if I have the double value that's equal to the sum, right? 0 0.1 plus 0 0.1 plus 0 0.1, right? You know mathematically that's equal to uh, 0 0.3. Uh, but if you ask C or Java, is x equal to 0 0.3, you will get back the answer false. So they're not exactly equal, right? And that's all due to the fact that uh, the number 0 0.1, you can't represent 0 0.1 exactly um, using float or double, which might be surprising, right? I mean, at 0 0.1, it looks like you can, right, you can easily write it down as a literal but it turns out it has no exact representation um, as float or double. Right, so let's um, just look at this little program here. Um, I should really, you know what, just give me a second here to fire up Eclipse. I should really uh, type this in for you uh, and run it. Sorry, I should have had this up and running beforehand. So I'm just gonna copy this, I hope. paste it into Eclipse as soon as it starts. So what this program is going to do is going to print out the sums, right? So it's going to print out 0 0.1 and the 0 0.1 plus 0 0.1 and so on and so on. Uh, and I'm going to print them out with as many digits as I have available to me. Sorry, what did I call this again? Um, floating point. We'll make a class floating point. Uh, I'm going to replace the contents with what's on the slide. We'll save that. Um, sorry, I think this might be a little small for you to read uh, because I didn't change the resolution of my monitor. Um, if you don't mind, I will just quickly change that. Unfortunately, it's awkward to find in Eclipse the setting for it. Uh, so, where are the editors? Somewhere there's a setting for colors and fonts. Um, Java text. Okay, so that's what I want to do. I want to edit that and I want to make it bigger. Hopefully that works. There we go. That's better. All right. So, um, I've got this, uh, I've got X here. Right. I'm going to check is x equal to 0 0.3 and I'm going to print the answer. Right. And then I'm going to print out a bunch of stuff um, that you'll see when I run the program. Run that. Oh, this is probably going to be, yeah, I have to change the console font too. Okay. So the first thing it prints out is false. 
right? So is x equal to 0 0.3? The answer is no, right? And so what's the reason for this? Well, here's the number 0 0.1 written as a double literal, right? I'm going to use this class called big decimal. Uh, so we're not going to really use this class during the course. Uh, you should know that it exists. Big decimal lets you, uh, gives you what's called a, an arbitrary precision uh, number, an arbitrary precision floating point number. Right. In other words, um, it can have as many digits uh, as you uh, want to give it. Right. So, you, in other words, uh, so you can change how many digits uh, are used to represent the number. Uh, so, I'm going to use big decimal to print a value of a floating point number. Right. Uh, so, what so what uh, what I really do is I use big decimal to take in a floating point number as a double, and then I'm going to ask it for the string representation of that number. So when I ask for the string representation of 0 0.1, this is what I get back, right? which is not exactly 0 0.1, right? It's almost 0 0.1, right? If you go out, it's 0 0.1 up to here, right? So after roughly 13 or 14 decimal places, um, it's no longer exactly equal to 0 0.1, right? So when I sum 0 0.1 twice, Right? So not surprisingly, you're going to sum this value twice and you end up with this value here. Right? So you end up with 0 0.2, a bunch of zeros, and then a 1. So it's not exactly equal to 0 0.2 either, right? which isn't surprising because 0 0.1 is not exactly 0 0.1. Uh, if I sum it three times, right, I get 0 0.3, right? and then over here I get a 4. So it's not exactly equal to 0 0.3. One more time. Right. If I do it with 0. Point, uh, if I sum uh, 0. 0.1 four times, I get a number that's not quite 0. 0.4. Right. And now the surprising part is, if I sum it five times, I get back exactly 0. 0.5. Uh, so that's a little surprising. Right. Uh, and then finally, if I print out what is 0. 0.3, so there's actually something um, in this expression here, right? There's actually something more complicated going on. Right? It's not just that 0 0.1 plus 0 0.1 plus 0 0.1 is not exactly equal to 0 0.3. Right? It's also the fact that 0 0.3 is not exactly equal to 0 0.3. Right? And so uh, there's actually two things happening here. Right? I can't represent the sum exactly, and I cannot represent 0 0.3 exactly. Right? And all of these things are kind of surprising um, if you haven't uh, used floating point arithmetic uh, on a computer before. All right, now, as a brief aside, the output from the previous program is misleading. Right? So if you have a double value, uh, then at most, you have somewhere between 15 and 17 significant digits after the decimal point, right? And when I printed them out using this, oh, wrong program, sorry. When I printed them out using this program, come on, here we go. Right? I have way more than 15 or 17 digits. Uh, so what's going on is, so what's going on is um, uh, I'm, I, well, I'm using the big decimal class to take the literal 0 0.1, and I'm going to convert that to the uh, nearest double value that we can represent. Right? So that's actually what happens when you type in 0 0.1 um, as a literal. Right? Java takes the 0 0.1, and it uh, produces the um, double value that is closest to 0 0.1. Right, and that value is actually represented in base two, so that's actually a binary uh, that has some sort of binary representation. Right, when I ask big decimal to for the string corresponding to zero point one, right, the string that it gives you back is the string that uh, you get by converting the base two value back to base ten. Right, so convert base uh, point one to base two, and then convert base two back that answer back to base ten. Right? And that's why there's so many digits uh, after the decimal point. Right? Uh, when you're working with double, you really you have to remember that you really only have that many significant digits um, when you're working in base 10. OK, so what's going on is that double float and double uh, use a standard called the IEEE 754 standard, uh, at least in Java. In C, um, on the desktop, it's also the IEEE 754 standard for the most part. Um, 
C actually said the language specification uh, does not actually require your C compiler uh, to use this standard. Uh, so in fact, uh, it is possible to write a C program that does not uh, that uses floating point arithmetic that doesn't behave the same on every computer. Uh, because the C the C standard allows um, different compiler implementations to use different uh, to use a different representation for their floating point numbers, but most of the time uh, you end up with uh, the IEEE 754 standard. Now the standard is very long; it's very complicated, so the details are well beyond the scope of this course. Um, but what you need to know uh, is that every floating point number has this form. So every floating point number that you write down um, internally, it's represented as some integer, right? So S is an integer. It can be signed, right? So plus or minus. Multiplied by two to some integer exponent. Right? So the integer exponent is also signed, so it can be positive or negative. Okay, so that's actually the representation of every floating point number. So why can't I represent 0 0.1 exactly in floating point? Right? And you can prove this um, fairly simply. Uh, you just, it's a proof by contradiction. Right. So if every floating point number has this form, right, then I should be able to find, then I want to know, can I find an S and an E? Sorry, someone's, uh, I have to let somebody in via little, the guest lobby. Okay, so uh, I want to know, can I find some value s, some integer value s, some integer value e, such that this um, equality, uh, such that this expression is true, right? That satisfies this in, uh, this inequality. Right? Now, uh, when you look at this expression, right, uh, you know that e has to be negative, right? As I have some integer here, right, times two raised to some power here, and it's less than one, right? It's supposed to be some value less than one. So that value of E must be a negative uh, value, right? So that this is one over two to some exponents. Okay, so, uh, well, what happens? So I've got S times two to the E is equal to 0 0.1, right? Let me multiply both sides by 10 so that I get rid of this decimal point. So I get 10 times S times two to the E is equal to one. Uh, divide both sides by two to the E. So I get 10s equals 1 over 2 to the e. Now remember, e is negative, right? Uh, so I can write, uh, I can bring the 2 to the e up, right, to the numerator by negating the exponent, right? So I have 10s equals 2 to the power negative e. And again, the value of e is negative. So this is actually a positive value, right? So this is 2. So there are the absolute value uh, e 2s multiplied together. Right. So this is 2 to the power absolute value of e. All right, that's just 2 times 2 times 2 e times. Right. Now what's on the left-hand side? There's a 10, so that's 2 times 5 right, times some unknown value s. Right. And you know right away that this can't possibly be true. Right. That's a contradiction. There's a 5 over here, and that's prime. There's no 5 over here. Right. And everything's an integer value, so there's no way this expression can be true. Right. The prime factorization of the left-hand side uh, cannot uh, be equal to the prime factorization of the right-hand side. So you know that 0 0.1 cannot be exactly represented uh, using um, uh, using float or double. So you should also know that float and double are 32-bit and 64-bit binary values. Right? So that's, how, that's how they're uh, defined under the IEEE standard. Uh, now, I don't want to write out 32 or 64 digits every time I talk about a binary, every time I talk about a floating point number. Right? I also don't want to talk about um, uh, bits, right? I'd rather use base 10 uh, because it's easier for most people to think uh, to reason about numbers in base 10, right? So I'm going to use a slightly different representation to talk about floating point numbers, right? Uh, so instead of using 32 or 64 digits, I'm going to use only four, right? To keep things simple, Furthermore, they're going to be decibels, right? A base 10. So this is what our float, our four-digit floating point number representation is going to look like. Okay, so I've got a three-digit number here. Right? So the first three digits of my four-digit number represent that value S, 
which is called the significant. Right. I'm going to use the rule that D1 cannot be zero. Okay. So in other words, um, when I have three numbers here, uh, the leading value is never a zero. The exponent is my fourth digit. So I have four digits in my number, so say one, two, three, four, right? So the four would be here, right? Now, I want to represent numbers, I want to be able to represent numbers that are less than one. So this exponent here, I have to be able to let it uh, become negative, right? Furthermore, I don't want to have to store the sign of the exponent, right? I'm storing it here. Uh, right, so there's actually a plus or minus sign in the front here. I don't want to use a plus or minus sign on the exponent. Uh, so the way I can get negative exponents is to include a bias, right? So the exponent of the number is defined as the fourth digit minus five. And that lets E uh, be in the range minus five to four. All right, everybody got that? So three, dig three digits significant, first digit's not zero. Right. Exponents always between minus five and four. So uh, how do you, uh, so what can I do with this? So in the first column, right, I've got my floating point representation, right? So three digits. And raised to some exponent. So uh, 100 times 10 to the minus five. Uh, its decimal value is just 0 0.1, uh, 0 0.001. Now, what is the next uh, largest floating point number that I can write down? Right. Well, the next largest floating point number, I only have three digits in the significant. Okay. So I can add one to 100 to get 101. 101, I don't change the exponent. Right. So my next largest decimal value is 0 0.00101. So that's the smallest uh sorry that's the smallest positive uh floating point value that i can write down right that's the second smallest positive floating point value that i can write down i can't make that exponent any smaller and i can't make 100 any smaller right because my rule says i have to use three digits and the first digit's not allowed to be zero Right. So, for example, I cannot, I'm not allowed to write 1 times 10 to the minus 5. So 100 times 10 to the minus 5, that's the smallest floating point value that I can write using this representation. Now, notice what the difference is between these two numbers. Right? It's 10 to the minus 5. Right? So the difference between this and this, right? it's the difference in the last digit. Right. Everybody with me so far? Any questions so far? All right. Uh, now, if I change the exponent to the next largest exponent, and the smallest positive number I can write using that exponent is 100 times 10 to the minus 4. Right? So that's 0 0.01. Right? And then the next largest number I can write is 101 times 10 to the minus 4. Right? So that's 0 0.0101. Right? Now, notice what the difference is between these two numbers. That's 0 0.0001, which is which has one less decimal point, right, compared to these numbers, right. So what this is trying to tell you is that the spacing between adjacent floating point values changes. Right, the spacing between these two values is always 10 to the minus five. As soon as the exponent becomes minus four, the spacing now becomes 10 to the minus four. So the spacing between adjacent floating point values depends on the exponent. If the exponent becomes two, and the two smallest numbers I can write, uh, the two smallest positive values I can write using that exponent are uh, 10,000 and 10,100. Right? So the spacing between floating point values is now 100. Right? There's no way for me to represent 10,001, for example. A way for me to represent 10,010. Uh, 10, right? The best I can do is 10,000 or 10,100. 
if, I, if the exponent becomes 10 to the power of 4, right, now the spacing between floating point numbers becomes 10,000. I can write down the number 1 million, but I can't write down the number 1 million in 1. Right? In fact, the next largest number I can write down is 1 million 10,000. So floating point numbers are weird. They're, they don't behave uh, the way you would expect them to. Right? The spacing between floating point values changes depending on the magnitude of the exponent. So that digit that's in the last place, right? so the distance between adjacent floating point values uh, changes depending on the value of the exponent. The distance between adjacent floating point values is called the unit in the last place or ULP, ULP. And it's the unit in the last place uh, that's often used for measuring errors in floating point values, right? So why is there error in floating point values? Because I can't represent every decimal value exactly. Right? I want to represent the value 1 million in 1, right? The closest floating point number I can write down with this representation is a million. So there's an error of one uh, unit. If I want to write down the, the uh, number uh, 10,050, right, there's no way for me to write that down. The closest I can write is that or that. Right? The error between 10,050, uh, when I actually convert it to a floating point number, becomes 50 ulps. Right? I, I either end up using this or I end up using this when I write 10,050. So if you want to find out how big an ulp is for any given uh, floating point value, you can use math.ulp, right? Pass in a floating point value, and it will tell you the distance to the next uh, to the next floating point value. Um, so when I talk about when we talk about error, right? Uh, if you know the true value of the thing that you're trying to represent, right? And then the actual value that's used to represent that value is x, right? then the absolute error is just the difference between those two values. Right? And then you take the absolute value. So when you take, when you write down some floating point value, right? uh, when you write down some real value, sorry, uh, that fits in the range of a floating point type, then when you convert it to, the, to its floating point representation, right? At most, that has an error of one half an ulp. Okay, so you have a real value that fits in the range of a floating point type, right? Then its nearest floating point value will have an error of one half ulp. Okay, so how do you compute errors in ulps? So ulps are weird; uh, they're a little strange. So the way you compute errors in ulps is you write uh, the true value as its floating point in its floating point form, right? So you take your true value x uh, hat and you write it using a, in our case, a three-digit significant and a one-digit exponent. Okay. Take your uh, actual value x and you also write it as a floating point value. You use the same exponent as the true value. Okay. And then you compute the absolute difference between the two values. Right. So let's look at an example. Suppose my true value is 1.29, right? Now remember, we're working in a four-digit um, floating point format, okay? So all these examples are four-digit floating point. My actual uh, value is 1.25, okay? So what's the absolute error? Well, I write 1.29 using my uh, floating point format, right? So that's 129 times 10 to the minus two. Write this down also using my floating point format, and I make sure that the exponent's the, the same, right? That's 125 times 10 to the minus two, right? Now my exponents are the same. I have three digits here, I have three digits here, right? The error in the last place is the difference uh, of 129 and 125, right? So that's four. The error measured in ulps is four ulps, right? Let's look at another example. Right, so this example was easy because uh, x hat and x, uh, they were both, ha they both have the same magnitude. 
Now, the magnitudes are different, right? So this is uh, the order of magnitude here is 10. The order of magnitude here is 1. Your exponents are going to be different. Right? Now I need to write this out using my floating point format. So that becomes 121 times 10 to the minus 1. Now, I want to write this out using my floating point format. Right? But I'm going to insist that the exponent be the same as this. Right? So now you're allowed to write 0, 0, 005. Right, so you're allowed to have leading zeros now when you compute the. Um, so this is five times ten to the minus one. Right, so exponents here are the same. Uh, so I now take this and subtract this. That's 116. The error in alps between x hat and x is 116 alps. Uh, now sometimes you know the true value as a real number as opposed to a floating point number, right? So for example, um, you might be trying to compute pi, right? And you know the true value. Well, you know that you can write down a pretty good representation of the true value of pi, right? So you might have a, uh, you might know the real number, uh, you might know the true value as a real number, right? So in this case, everything stays the same. It's just that when you write down your true value, you just keep everything uh, you keep all the uh, all the digits after the decimal point, right? So in other words, you don't insist that there's uh, only three digits in the true value. Right? There's three digits in the front before the decimal point, but you can keep all the other digits after the decimal point. So if I want to know the difference between these two values, right? This becomes 592 times 10 to the 2? Yeah, 592.875 times 10 to the 2. 580, uh, 58,900 is just 589 times 10 to the 2. Right. And exponents are the same. Do your subtraction. So your difference is 3.875603 alps. Right. So the key to remember here is that when you're computing the errors, your exponents have to be the same. Right. The value of the exponent is determined by the true value, right? not the approximated value. Uh, if you want to compute relative error, um, then it's just the absolute value. It's the absolute error divided by the true value. Uh, however, when you compute relative error, you don't use the floating point format. Right? You just use whatever the values of x hat, x, uh, and x are. Right? And compute it using um, real mathematics. Right? You don't use floating. You don't use floating point. Okay, but we're. Uh, I'm not. Uh, so that the notebook that talks about floating point error. Um, goes into relative error a little bit. I'm mostly concerned about um, uh, absolute error in this uh, lecture. Okay, so where does error appear uh, when you work with floating point numbers, right? So one place error occurs is when you write down a literal uh, that can't be represented exactly um, in base two, right? Now we're not really concerned about that because all of our numbers are base 10 for now. So another place error occurs is when you do arithmetic. So, for example, if I add uh, 12.1 and 63.8, right, there's a possibility uh, that some error occurs when I compute the sum. Right, so let's look at an example. Uh, I want to add these two numbers. Uh, so the way you add these two numbers is you write them out in their floating point format. Right, so here I have 121 times 10 to the minus 1. 63.8 is 638 times 10 to the minus 1. Now, their exponents are the same, so I don't have to do anything special here. Uh, I add them together, and I get 759 times 10 to the minus 1. So that's good. Uh, so it turns out I can represent this sum exactly. Right? So in other words, I can compute this sum exactly in my floating point form, uh, representation. Similarly, I can compute the sum of uh, 81,500 and 13,600 exactly. Right? I write that out. Write out the two numbers in their floating point representation. So there they are. Sum, everything's fine, right? I have three digits here. I have a valid exponent here. So I can represent that sum exactly. Now, when a result produces an extra digit, that's when I have a problem. Right? So 82.1 and 63.8, uh, 63 write them out in their floating point formats, compute their sum. Right, that sum has four digits in it. 
which is a problem because my representation only has three, uh, only has three digits in the significant. Right. So when I compute the sum, I end up with one four five, one four five nine, right, times ten to the minus one. Uh, I'm only allowed to keep three of these digits because that's how my floating point representation works. So for our purposes, we round this number. So I uh, raise the exponent by one, so it becomes ten to the zero. That becomes one forty five point nine, okay, times ten to the zero. So we then round the one forty five nine up. Right, so there's one forty five point nine. Uh, similarly here, right? If I add these two numbers, um, I end up with a fourth digit in the significant. Right? I'm not allowed to keep four digits. So I raise the exponent by one. That becomes 175.1 times 10 to the three. Right? I round uh, to get rid of the decimal, the uh, the digit after the decimal point to get 175 times 10 to the three. Right? Notice now that that answer here, that answer here, right? Those are not exactly the same as their true values. Right? So right away, uh, so the the act of addition or subtraction can introduce errors into the uh, result. OK, now what happens if the operands have very different exponents? Okay. So the rule here is uh, the operand. You take the operand with a smaller exponent, right, and you scale it so that the exponents are the same. Okay. So here I've got 4,320,000, and I have 12.1. Right, so I write out the first number in its floating point format. Right, so 432 times 10 to the 4. This one would be 121 times 10 to the minus 4, uh, minus 1. Right. Instead, what I do is I scale that number up so that it's written using the same exponent as that number here. And I end up with 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0.000121. Right. The reason I'm doing this is because now I can now add these values here. Right, that's the reason for the scale. So I end up with 432.00121. Right, that's my intermediate result. Uh, and then I, for my final result, I'm only allowed to keep three digits. Right, so these disappear, and I get 432 times 10 to the four. Right. Uh, notice something strange has happened here. Right. I have a positive number, and I add a positive number. Right, so that's x plus y. Right, the final answer is equal to x. So I have the situation where x plus y is equal to x, where neither x nor where both x and y are positive. Right, y is not zero. Right, which is a mathematical contradiction, but it's simply a fact of life when you work in floating point. Right, you can add two numbers, uh, both of which are not zero. And you can get back the answer that's equal to one of the original two numbers. Uh, that's just the way floating point works. Now, notice that to compute this result, right? To actually compute this result, I needed eight digits, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, right? Which means if you're doing this on a computer in hardware, right, your hardware actually needs extra digits, right? So if you've got hardware uh, that's specialized to some um, three digit significance, right? You actually need to have extra digits in order to be in order to compute the sum exactly. Right? So what that means is when you go to add two floating point numbers uh, in hardware, right? Uh, so we say that two doubles have 64 bits, right? Your hardware actually needs extra bits to represent the extra digits to compute the sum. Now, using extra digits was not always feasible in computer hardware, right? So way back in the day when computers were first made, there was uh, no way you could feasibly insert extra bits uh, to compute the sum, right? Now, on modern hardware, uh, you do in fact have extra bits, right? So um, for example, uh, IEEE says that a double is 64 bits. Uh, but in hardware, on an Intel CPU, for example, uh, you actually have 80 bits uh, to represent the number, right? So uh, modern hardware has extra bits to do this, um, 
very, very old hardware or very, very inexpensive hardware may not have um, extra bits, or they may not have extra bits that you, uh, as many extra bits as you want. Okay. Um, now, if you don't have extra bits, right, then there's no way you can write out this 0 0.00121, right? There's no way you can store these digits. So if you don't have extra bits, you have to discard all the extra digits. Instead of summing 432 and 0.00121, you throw away everything after the decimal point. When you compute the sum, what ends up happening is it's 432 plus zero, right? Which is why you get back uh, the original, uh, why, which is why you get back the larger number of 432 uh, times 10 to the four. Right, uh, and so um, the fact that floating point, the fact that the spacing between floating point numbers changes as the exponent changes, right, produces results like this. I have a large number, a, a number with a large magnitude, and I add a number with a small magnitude. Uh, there is the possibility that the number with a small magnitude um, becomes zero when you add them. Okay, now the problem if you don't have extra digits, right? So if your hardware does not have extra digits, then the mere act of addition or subtraction ends up introducing very, very large errors. Okay. So I'm gonna take 10.5 and I'm gonna try to subtract 9.98, right? Uh, those numbers are not very different, right? They're 0.52 apart. Uh, you can do that calculation in your head. Now I have no extra digits in my uh, in my floating point system or on hardware if you want to think of it that way instead. Right. So how do I compute the difference? Well, I write 10.5 out as 105 times 10 to the minus one. I write this out also using the exponent 10 to the minus one. So when I write out uh, 9.98. Uh, times 10 uh, as a some integer times 10 to the minus one, right? That becomes 99.8. There should be a point eight here, but I don't have any extra digits, so I throw it away. Right? You don't round, it's gone, it's discarded, right? So I end up with 99. When I take, when I do this, the difference, I end up with six. That's 600 times 10 to the minus three. Right, or 0 0.6, right? Now, the true answer is 520 times 10 to the minus three, right? The true answer is much higher. The answer is 0.6, right? And alps, well, it's 600 minus 520, which is 80, which is enormous. The, the, uh, the absolute error is enormous, right? It's 80 alps. The standard says that the error must be within half an alt. So when you add or subtract two numbers, the IEEE standard says, says uh, the result must be within one half alt. Here, I'm 80 alts, right? So I'm uh, one, two orders of magnitude too big, almost, right? Uh, which is not good. Uh, that's that's bad. So. Um, you actually do need extra digits in order to satisfy the IEEE standard, right? In order to get to a half alt error, uh, I have to insert some extra digits, right? These extra digits are called guard, uh, are called guard uh, digits. So if I use one extra digit, right, and I recompute the previous example, right, I actually get back the true result. Right? So that's good. Um, uh, so uh, when you do the subtraction, I get 5.2 times 10 to the minus one, right? I have an extra digit, so I have the fourth digit. So I, I now convert this back to its um, to its floating point form, right? I can write that as 520 times 10 to the minus three, right? So that's fine. So I actually get the correct answer. So it looks like by adding one yard digit, uh, I can um, I might be able to achieve this one half alt error. It turns out that's not quite true. It's almost true, it's not quite true, right? So a single guard digit is not sufficient. So for example, if I compute 110 minus 
right, using one extra digit, right? Uh, so when I write out 8.59 as some number times 10 to the zero, right, that becomes 8.5, right? The nine is here, but I don't have that extra digit, so it's gone, right? It disappears. Uh, I compute the difference and I end up with 102 times 10 to the zero, right? The true value is that, right? It's 101.41. Uh, so if I take 102 and subtract 101.41, you get 0 0.59, right? Which is slightly too big, right? So it's slightly bigger than one half alt. So you actually need two guard digits um, when you're working in base 10 uh, to achieve the one half alt error, right? In modern hardware, uh, modern desktop hardware, uh, you typically have um, several extra bits uh, to compute this alt, right? So that's how modern hardware guarantees uh, the one half alt error. OK, what time is it? 11.16. I think I'm going to stop there because the uh, well, the next part's interesting, um, but I don't want to introduce the problem and then not be able to see what happens um, when you try to subtract uh, two floating point values that are close together. Right? Uh, it's pretty interesting what happens. So I'll do that on, um, I guess, Monday. Monday. Uh, and we're done for this week. Does anybody have any questions about the material from today's lecture? Um, if you're, there will be an assignment coming out soon. Now, the, as I've mentioned before, the problem that I'm having is that I have two deferred exams that need to be marked. Uh, so uh, I will try to get your assignment out uh, this weekend, uh, but I can't promise anything because there's a lot of exams that need to be marked. I apologize for that, but that's just the way uh, life is this term. All right, uh, no questions? Um, professor, I don't have Hi. a question about um, the material, but I just have a question in terms of the lab. Yep. Um, I've been getting um, an error, and I was wondering if you could um, help me take a look at it. I sure can. Uh, do you have time okay. um, after today's class? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So why don't we just wait a few minutes and see if anybody else has any other questions, and then um, yep. I'll, I'll just deal with it. Sounds good. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else? All right. That's good. Um, so if you don't, uh, 